or it's me. All right, let's let's just begin in Ephesians chapter six, and I'm going to read from ten, uh, verse ten, uh, through to twenty. There, uh, Paul remember is writing to this church in Ephesus, and uh, he's in prison as he's writing this. I think we'll gather this from the the text here. And uh, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore. Hear that word a lot over and over and over. Stand, stand, stand. Stand therefore. And I lost my place. I shouldn't do that. Stand therefore, having uh, fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on uh, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you will can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may de uh, declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And so that's the, the context of what we're going to be talking about here uh, in these days. But I, I'm just going to cover the first probably three verses or so today. Uh, if you're a Christian, God has given you special safety uh, equipment for us to use. <laughs> uh, uh, eventually, in, in later in my lifetime, or right early in my lifetime, they began to put seatbelts in cars a little more. <laughs> and they're meant for our safety and so on. So there's a lot of things out there for uh, safety. If you have some certain jobs, they require you to wear uh, steel-toed boots, you know, or or a helmet in certain sections of your work. Why do they do that? It's for our protection. For uh, scientists will wear when they're messing with uh, dangerous chemicals and so on. That what uh, those goggles, right? And uh, safety goggles and different things. A fireman has for his protection, you know, a fire suit uh, to help him in in the battle of fire. And so all again for their our protection. And uh, police wear bulletproof vests as well, again, for their protection. And so uh, just to remember that, that we need these protections sometimes. And Paul is bringing out something very practical. It's practical for you kids here today, what I'm going to talk about. It's not. That's why even at VBS, we were talking to, how, what was the age of starting? Five. I don't think five is too young to talk about the armor of God and putting it on. This is for us older people. Uh, and so it's for every every one of us here, this, this has to do with us and for our protection, for the advancement of God's kingdom as well. Uh, the Bible does tell us how that we have an enemy and he's real, okay? It's how it's repeated over in this text, uh, you know, that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Uh, he's real. A lot of people say, well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in the devil. Or, I believe in heaven, but I don't believe in hell. So it's kind of picking and choose. Man, we don't get to pick and choose. God is, I, get, I say this often, God is not who you think he is. God is who he says he is. And so you take this book and you take all of it. And I went my bookmark. But take all of it, all of it, and believe it with all your heart. Do what Matt said today. Trust it. Trust it. Stake your life on it. This is real. And so the devil is a real created being that God created. And he, in his uh, pride and so on, the Bible tells us he, he fell from his position as an angel. 
And it dragged a third of the angels with him into this rebellion against God. And they're in rebellion to this day. And uh, they're real. The powers of darkness are real. And I, I've had friends who that's all they can talk about. The devil and how he works. And every time you get a conversation, the devil is like, who they talk about? Oh, he does this. Watch it when you get this feeling up this finger. And weird. I mean, you get weird stuff too. <laughs> I've met a few weird weirdos, okay? And uh, But I don't want to, uh, you know, underestimate him either for those who never talk about the devil as though he's not a, a real entity, somebody to, to be reckoned with. Why would we have this in here today? that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil if he's not real, okay? So he is real, and he fights against God. He hates God. He tried to usurp his authority and so on. Even the, even the, the temptation Bruce had us do last week in Sunday school. He, Jesus was tempted by Satan. And he come down at the end, he just said, just bow down and worship me. I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. You can have it all. And Jesus replied with scripture, and so should we. He's given us a an armor to put on. See, it's easy for us to kind of think of this. In Paul's day, as this letter was read, it was easily understood. Every child out there knew what a soldier looked like, what a Roman soldier. They were everywhere. And th those were the power of the day. And so Paul, he, he's in prison. Uh, sometimes he was chained to to prisoners, and maybe he was sitting in prison looking up, talking about how he's thinking about how he's defeated. Oh, that would be a good illustration the Holy Spirit gave him, not his own thinking. He said, oh, look at that. He's got a belt on. Let's call that the belt of truth and teach a lesson with that. And so with everything, he just took the soldier that he was probably chained to or saw often, and every kid and child in the church at Ephesus understood what he meant, you know, the military, they need protection. <laughs> they had armored vehicles. They need, the, again, for our protection. And so as Paul is writing, he's going to use this uh, spiritual truth and practical lessons. Guys, this is for everyday life. Uh, don't think it's, it's just a, <laughs> when there's a casting out of a demon or something that that's when he's involved. This is everyday life. Everyday life as you go to work in the morning, as you wake up at night. As you wake up in the morning or whatnot, the reality is there of a temptation, right? We can all be tempted and, and, and the devil's sly. That's why he says, watch out for the schemes of the devil. He's got tricks up his sleeve. He's been around a while. He's no match for God. Let me tell you that, though. He's no match for God. In fact, the, you know, I, I kind of have the feeling he's, he's weaker in power than when he was created because sin always has that degradating Part of it. So though he was an angel, I believe he, he he's weaker now than he was because of sin. But he's still a powerful foe. He's no match for you and me in our own strength, right? And so let's be clear about, uh, about that. So demons are evil spirits who sinned against God and who now continually work evil in this world. Satan is said, the word, the Hebrew word is for adversary, carried over to the New Testament too. Adversary. In other words, you have an enemy. You and I have a real, and he's real. He's real. Now, I, I don't want to go and even have these weeks just be all about the devil. This is, that's not the point, really. The point is how do, we, how do we overcome? How do we get victory in our life when he, maybe we constantly are defeated in an area of our life? God has given us weapons. Aren't you God? God has, has helped us here in this area. He, um, and so th this invisible world, can I say, that we don't see with our physical eyes is just as real as the one you see without, right? Remember, uh, was it Elijah? I can never remember Elijah, Elisha's servants, and they're surrounded by the enemy. And uh, he's, he's freaking out. He's just wondering, what? The armies are coming around. So they circled us. They got us all surrounded. He's, he's really scared to death. And Elijah just prays and says, God, open his eyes. And all of a sudden, he sees the army of the Lord around the camp. A greater is he that is with you than he that is against us, isn't it? And so the spiritual world is real. It's real. And so I, I just uh, say that because of, of so many times <laughs> what I hear today, oh, it's not real. But anyway, but there are two kingdoms, kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. The one the kingdom that we're born into and the other to which you enter by being born again. 
a spiritual birth takes place and we become his child. So, uh, yeah, so let's take the first few verses. Let me just read the first three again, or 10 through 13, for four verses there. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you will, may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand firm. As uh, most of you know, I, I wrestled and we with athletes in action as well in Eastern Europe and smuggling Bibles into into. Uh, Eastern Europe and stuff. And we were doing a demonstration somewhere in Germany. We'd get into universities. These guys, I don't know how these guys got us that I worked with got us into these places. But we do wrestling demonstrations in a university and then we share our, our, our testimonies there and we had an audience to share it with. But I'll never forget this lady, this young girl comes up to us after, afterwards, madder than heck at me, just handed me a piece of paper with a Bible verse on it and walked away with a scowl on her face because we just shown a wrestling demonstration. It was this verse, she says, she said, I read it. It says, we do not wrestle, big knot. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And she was angry that we were sharing the gospel there through wrestling. <laughs> no, that's, that's not the point there is that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I, but I, in other words, it's a spiritual foe. You can't you can't beat the devil by taking him doing a double leg takedown, okay? Or some kind of take. It's not physical in that sense where I muster up the power. And that's what he starts off in the very beginning saying. Finally, brethren, be strong where? In the Lord. And in the power of whose might? His might, right, kids? God's strength. So he doesn't expect us to strengthen ourselves to do this work and defending against the schemes of the devil. We, we can't. And so he, he purposely starts it out there, be strong in the Lord. Let me just take this in a real simple way. We've already read the text. So let me just give some kind of an order to it so we understand this. Uh, number one, since our battle is not against human beings or flesh and blood primarily, but rather against supernatural forces, against spiritual forces of of evil, it says in verse 12. And uh, to wrestle is a, is a struggle, it's a, it's a fight, it's a combat, okay? So this is a real combat that goes on, that we're involved in. And maybe you say, oh, I didn't know I was getting in the way. <laughs> this is what we got into when God changed our life. Um, and so number two, because you know we wrestle against these, or struggle and, and battle and combat these kind of forces, Therefore, number two, put on the whole armor of God. We have an adversary, so we need armor. Very simply put. Number three, why do we put this armor on? So that we will be strong in the Lord against the devil's schemes. Number four, so that you may be able to resist. It says, resist him in the evil day. And after you resist him, you might stand firm. Hey, that's the whole picture. Stand firm. And having done all, it finishes the verse of today. It means after you put on all the armor, what do you do? You stand firm. Stand firm. So I hope this will explain it as we get into it a little bit here today. Uh, and I want to say this is, again, let me emphasize, this is as you live everyday life. We need to trust God. It's not just trusting God when I got saved. The Galatians made that mistake. that They thought they could now live the Christian life in their own strength and by keeping the law and things. No, no, no. He says, that's a different gospel. He said, the one we preach is trust. So it's, it's this continually day by day, as Matt talked about, just trusting him. If he told us to walk across Niagara in that wheelbarrow, if Jesus is at the helm, I'll get in. <laughs> so we get in all the way with him. Um, and his job, again, the devil's going to try to discourage you, to keep you down uh, and destroy you. He's, the Bible says he's a murderer from the beginning, and he's a liar. Um, Adam and Eve, think of it, uh, of daily life. This, it came so subtly. All of a sudden, 
the enemy comes in the form of a serpent to, to Eve. You know, did God really say? First, kind of planting doubt in, did God really say? And then he gets on to the end and he said, oh, you're not going to die. Surely you're not going to die if you eat of this fruit. So he lied, outright lied. The Bible says he's a liar and the father of lies. Never believe the devil's going to tell you the truth. He might use some scripture like we did in Sunday school where he uses scripture and he twists it. But you combat him again back with scripture. And we'll get into that probably later on. But Adam and Eve, it, he came and subtly worked with Jane Miter think and came, but it just came in the course of a normal thing, just eating a eating a meal. See, and and he can work. And so that's what I mean by every day, and we fight against his schemes. He's got different strategies. He's cunning, the Bible says he's cunning. You know, I I, I know a lot of people who think, well, when the devil appears, he always, you know, the a horn and you know, a tail and red and so on and oh we'll recognize him you know no or even i was watching with a friend of mine he was a mechanic in germany his name was hans we're watching the jesus or the bible film together he'd never really seen it he knew a little bit about the bible but and he's watching eve take this fruit and satan's uh you know tempting her and he's grabbing it like this i'll never forget that i mean he's a grown man he was uh, quite a bit older than me when i we watched it and he said won't do it you know, she's reaching for it, and he's, he's making comment. Don't do it. Don't. Do it. Oh, you idiot, he says. He said, you know, he was really into it. God said not to do it, and you did it, you idiot. And he said, I just can't believe she took it after knowing God. But it was deceptive. And then this is how the devil works. He said, if that was me, I would have never done that. And so I said, Hans, didn't you just lie to a customer out there a little while ago? I heard you say you, you bought the car for this much and they're selling. You told your wife you sold it for a different price. I said, isn't that the same thing? Oh, well, I won't lie to God. I only lie to people. He thought that was okay. He thought that was okay. You can lie to people, but you, can, don't, you better never lie to God. Anyway, see, see how the devil worked too? He thought as long as it was Eve, he could see the evil in it. But when he came to himself, oh, I'm, I'm good. And that's a scheme of the devil too. I always put, look at somebody else and put somebody else down or look, oh, what a failure they are, and rather realize that I'm a sinner too. I need the grace of God too. Anyway, I don't know how I got there. <laughs> uh, Colossians, or 2 Corinthians 10 to 3 and 4 say this, and though we walk in the flesh, though we walk in this human body, we are not waging war according to the flesh, right? unless you're a soldier or something in the real, but says, for our weapons are of the, our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. See? Again, he says that. The weapons of our warfare aren't of the flesh. But, and Bob and I were talking about this one day over dinner, a little bit, that we'd wrestle not against flesh and blood. But Bob made a good point. But we do. We do wrestle against spiritual forces. We do wrestle against these. We struggle against these. They're real. And so he says, fine, when he says, finally, be strong, he's being be empowered. You know, if I told somebody else, Bruce, be strong. Bruce would take it to mean he goes to the gym, their planet fitness, and he starts pumping iron and getting some biceps and something. Come on, Bruce, be strong. It, that's not the strength he's talking about here, is it? If this is the strength of another. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Well, how can I be strong through the power of somebody else's might? If Bruce does the work, how are my biceps going to get bigger? <laughs> Physically speaking, it doesn't work, does it? But spiritually speaking, it does. What is he talking about? He's not talking about strength to lift a car off of a loved one, though God can give you grace to do that. But what he's talking about is inner strength, inner power, inner power to fight these battles. Um, inner strength. And to be found standing, see, he keeps bringing up the word standing, that when you're crushed by sorrow, you're still standing. I'm not saying that you're never going to have sorrow in your life. The devil may come along and give you so, so, uh, some circumstance, and I'm, I'm not blaming the devil for everything, okay? We, we, we sin enough without his help <laughs> because of our flesh and our own uh, inner nature, but I'm just saying he would love to see you be crushed by sorrow. The loved one might die, and you just can't let go. God, why? 
Some of you in here have said that. God, why did you take my love for me? Why did you do this? And you get actually angry at God. God, why? That's why we need this armor, right? He says, so that even if we're crushed by this sorrow, we're still standing. We're standing. We may fall, but we'll get right back up on our feet and get that shield up and get, get this weaponry that we've been given to fight with. And come on, he'll try to crush you by opposition, and then you'll stand. He'll try to cr crush you by conflict, but you stand. He'll try to slander you, say all manner of evil against you falsely on account of his name. But then even that, you stand. You stand. And won't be crushed by it. This is the kind of power we're talking about, that inner power. To make a stand spiritually, despite what whatever the devil throws at you or me. We read the book of Job. I'm amazed every time I read that first chapter or two of Job. My, the Lord gave, he loses everything, his kids, his farm, everything. He says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'd say he had a little bit of armor on, wouldn't you? <laughs> Oh, my. His power in us to stand firm. Again, that's why we need him going. We need Jesus every day. That's why we got to be in this book every day. Feed our soul and to walk with God. Stand strong in the Lord and the power of his mind. How did Paul do it? Let's just look at a few examples in his life that we maybe didn't think of this way. We always think of it maybe when he saw that... Um, in Philippi, that demon-possessed girl, you know, and he realized, even though she was saying things that were good, he rebuked her and cast out, and that caused him prison. He got beat up and everything because he took the business away from these guys who were making money out of fortune-telling. Let me, as long as I'm on fortune-telling real quick, just say, stay away from that stuff. Uh, I'm surprised how many people dabble in mediums and spirit world. Uh, it's dangerous. It's real. Some of it is. Some of it is. But... I just want to say, say the Bible says, stay away from it. God says. I've had people come back and say, wish things, certain things are happening now that they can't get away from. Help me. I want out of this situation. I want out of the influence of these things in my life. And they're real. So but how did Paul do it? In Philippians chapter 4, if you want to look there, I'm sure you're familiar with it. But in Philippians chapter 4 and verses 12 and 13. Philippians 4.12, <clears throat> I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. I just like this. Paul has had times in his life when you could say he was on a mountaintop high. Just things were going so good for him. He had more than enough. And other times where he didn't even have enough. And he said, there's a secret, and I've learned it. He said, I've learned it. It didn't just happen to have this because he had God in his life. It's something he learned that God taught him as he went through life. I have learned, he says, in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The devil might use that plenty or might use that lack to show him. Paul says, I have learned a secret here, how to be content in every circumstance possible. But he says, I can do anything. Again, who's in my own strength? No. Through Christ who strengthens me. Christ strengthens me. Paul said, and so Paul learned that. Now he's passing it on to the Ephesians. Hey, put on this armor. It works. It works. I've learned the secret. Of being content. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2, and I'll read a few from 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, just given who, who strengthened Paul. You say, man, what a mighty apostle he was. What, in his flesh? <laughs> no. He was as weak as we, as any of us. Elijah was a man of like passions like you and I. He was no different. We always think of these super saints, you know. They were just like you and me, had the same temptations you, but they had a God who was strong, and they relied on him. 
And so Paul is just telling Timothy, Timothy, you're a young preacher. And he says, I've learned one thing. He says, uh, I thank him who has given me strength. God gave me strength in the heat of the battle to get through things. I never being missionary in Macedonia and things that happened. I just praise God looking back now to realize it wasn't anything I did or my protection. And God protected us from a lot of things. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.1 says, You then, my child, talking to Timothy, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And so I'm telling you the same thing. Be strong, be strength in, in the grace. How does it say it? I'll read it again. Then you, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And you can be strengthened. It's grace, isn't it? What did we deserve? What do we deserve that Jesus should give his all for us? That we sang. What do we do? Did he see something good in us that he saw worthy of? Of wow, that person deserves to be saved and rescued by me. He saw nothing like that in us. We by ourselves in our own nature. We're children of wrath, even as others. But his love is the Matt, Matt's verse for us all. John three sixteen for God so loved. In what kind of manner? How, how do you know he loved us? Look at. He gave his only begotten son to die on that cross. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so you need to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And Paul says, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And because of that grace, he strengthens me when I need it. And Timothy, you young preacher that I'm kind of leading and helping to be a preacher, you be strong. And I say that to you kids and every single person in here, be strong by the grace of, that's in Christ Jesus. Would Jesus ask you this to put on the whole armor of God if it just meant for you to read it and go on with life without giving it a second thought? I guarantee you, you'll need that armor this week. Okay? Let me just guarantee you, you'll need this armor this week to get victory anyway. And so... Let's look at another case in 2 Timothy, as long as we're in 2 Timothy. Would you turn there? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I think I'll start reading at verse 14, just so we can get the, the context here a little bit. Uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, again, same one we've been talking about here. In verse 14, he says, Alexander, Alexander the coppersmith did great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. See, he had some opposition here. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. Who do you think behind that? Strongly opposing our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. Paul's left alone at his first defense. You think he'd have somebody standing with him there. He says, but everybody abandoned me. They all deserted me. No one came and stood by me. May it not be charged against them. God be merciful to them. But the Lord stood by me. I could preach a whole sermon on that. The Lord stood by me. And when all others forsook him, he said, the Lord stood by me. And strengthened me. See that? Did Paul need strength at this point? Apparently he did. He didn't have it to stand trial there, to stand in the midst of what he was facing in his own strength. Even when people abandoned him, the ones he probably thought, wow, I thought you were my friends. <laughs> Here I'm standing alone. What's happening? But God stood with me and strengthened me. So, uh, so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear of it. Hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Who do you think that was? Peter talked about the devil like that, didn't he? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Is that just fancy words, or is it true? And Paul says, I've been rescued from the, the mouth of the lion. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into he his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. But you see, he looked to God to strengthen him in his hour of need. Even when all abandoned you, 
My dad said that to a, somebody who was supporting him financially. And I remember dad telling me this later. I heard him, overheard him talking about it. But he said, I looked at that person. I said, brother, I don't know what I would do without your support. Just a short time after that, that person, that family dropped, stopped supporting him. He pretty, much, pretty soon he found out <laughs> that what he would do without their support. Right? God came through. God comes through. And so our reliance isn't on our strength, our finances or anything. It's in the Lord, in the strength of his mind. He says, put on this armor. I provided for you. And we'll talk about what it all means here to help us in this battle because you need help. I need help against the schemes of the devil. And don't think the devil doesn't come to church. <laughs> he comes to church, all right. Uh, and so it's in, he said, but all the Gentiles heard it. It's in the, you know what he hates the most, it seems like? When you try to tell other people about Jesus, when you try to tell your testimony, I don't know how many times it is, even in the nursing home here in town, I was getting to the meat of the gospel. We were just getting to things and the fire alarm goes off. Oh, everybody leaves, you know, and I was just getting and I couldn't just sit there and say, hey, you know, listen, we had to all leave the building and I never got to get back to that right then, you know, and stuff like that will happen. You'd be surprised. How many times in the Bible study we were getting to the meat of the gospel again and somebody turns on a vacuum cleaner and starts cleaning the I could tell story after story like that. But it's just interesting how we call them coincidences. But our, Lord, strengthen me. Help me in this. Um, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Pavle Tsekov, recently I shared this with you. He's been here with us. He's from Macedonia, but a missionary in Slovakia with his wife. And he travels the world preaching the gospel. He asked us to help him pray, and we helped support him on his trip to Africa here recently. And he was in Zambia and Zimbabwe. I can't remember exactly. Preaching the gospel there. And you know how he preaches. With all his heart. With all his heart. And he comes back, and I we get a call from him. Dan, please pray for me. I'm under attack. I'm under attack. And I wonder what that looked like. And he began to explain. He said, listen, as soon as I got done with my preaching in Africa, he says, I've been in bed for five days. Couldn't get up. Sick. Sicker than a dog. He says, on top of that, there's some issues in Macedonia I have to settle with my brother. Things got out of hand, and I have to get down there now. Right after his trip trying to recover. And he has to travel, make that long journey down there, drive down to Macedonia, deal with a situation that seemed impossible, but God helped him. And while he's down there trying to deal with that problem, spending quite a few days with it, doing that problem, he just felt the Holy Spirit saying, call your wife, call your wife. So he calls her and she's passed out on the floor and wakes up to the phone ring and she had blood, she'd fallen down and and didn't know what was happening. He kind of woke her up with the phone call. She had a phone, must have been right by her. And they called for, he called for an ambulance away from Macedonia, all the way to Slovakia to go pick her up and call the kids over to the house to check on her and stuff. And he just said, Dan, I'm under attack. What did he do? He said, pray, pray for me, pray for me. And she needed to go, she had a heart attack and something like it anyway, her heart was weak. They took her into surgery. And the doctor got done, I think he finished in like 35 minutes or 34 minutes, whatever it was, the surgery he did on her heart. And he said to her afterwards, he says, I don't know what happened. He said, but I've never done a surgery in 34 minutes on a heart. And she said, I know why. We've been praying for you. And they shared the gospel with him right there. And the man was in tears as he's listening to them tell them, share the gospel. Others, the nurses got to hear it. Others were moved by this. And guess what? The devil left him. As he said, he wasn't winning. He was actually, God used this situation to actually further the gospel. That doctor who would have never heard otherwise, the devil thought he was getting the best of Father, trying to discourage him. You just, and often after victory, preaching in a long time, you come, at least I come home exhausted. I'm tired. As they say in Macedonia, they squeeze the last drop of water out of you before you leave. You're going to use you to your fullest. Then go home and die, but we're going to use you here. And you come back exhausted. And that's when the devil can really. Use you. you. You get idle. You think, well, I, I need a rest now. I mean, there's a time for that, yes. But boy, and I see how that works. But in Pavel's situation, God kept getting the glory everywhere in Macedonia with his brother. God worked things out. God got the praise. His wife, many got to hear the gospel and the surgeons in tears listening to the gospel. 
the devil realized he'd stuck his foot in his mouth. He left him alone. What's the Bible say in James? Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, those aren't just words, people. <laughs> this is something we practice. Jesus even said it when, when the Peter, Peter said something. When he says, I'm going to the cross. Oh, Lord, you're, for God forbid that you should go to the cross. Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. Peter, who just a little bit before this says, flesh and blood doesn't reveal this to you, Peter, but my spirit. One minute God was using Peter's mouth through the Holy Spirit, the next the devil was using his words. He didn't even know. And Jesus says, get behind me, say. And Jesus, at the end of his temptation that Bruce had us read last week in Sunday school, it was the same thing, wasn't it? The same thing. He said, be gone, Satan. And he quoted one scripture and he was gone. Said it left him. It doesn't mean he's not coming back and he's going to try to trip you up. But God is the ruler of his good kingdom. The devil is kind of the ruler of the evil kingdom. And there's he's no match for God. One is one of lies and one is of truth. One is of God is the only omnipotent one. The devil, he, he has, he's not almighty. Did you know that Satan's not, I don't know, somebody, you get the idea that Satan's everywhere present just like Jesus is. He's not. He's one individual spirit, and he can't be at all places at once, okay? So if he's bothering you, at least he's left the rest of the world alone. <laughs> but he has his demons, and they all affect people. But it's real. It's real. God has limited. He defeated him at Calvary. You know what the Bible tells us in Revelation? The devil and his angels will be cast forever into the lake of fire. It was made for him. That was what the lake of fire in hell was made for. For him. And his end is coming. And he knows it. And that's why when Jesus pulled up the seam, are you come to torment us before the time? Oh, they're real. So finally, he is a defeated foe in the end. Just as physical armor and equipment is needed, so we need this spiritual armor that Jesus gave us to put on against temptation of sin or discourage us. I just want to read one, one sentence or a paragraph here, and I'm done from uh, uh, Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology. Just on this uh, topic of Satan, he said, Just as Satan tempted Eve to sin against God, so he tried to get Jesus to sin and thus fail in his mission as Messiah. He gives verses for all these things, which I'm not going to give you. Uh, the tactics of Satan and his demons are to use lies, deception, murder, and every other kind of destructive activity to, uh, to attempt to cause people to turn away from God and destroy themselves. Demons will try every tactic to blind people to the gospel. That happens. To blind people to the gospel and to keep them in bondage to things that hinder them from coming to God. They will also try to use temptation, doubt, guilt, fear. I know. I know what it's like to feel guilty, even as a believer, and wonder if I was really saved. The darkest time of my life. I've told you about that before. I'm not going to go into it, but it was the worst time of my life. I just kept teaching Bible studies in Germany, just going on, but miserable inside. Just wondering if I was sick. Guilt, he pour it on. He'll pour it on. Guilt, fear, confusion, sickness, envy, pride, slander, or any other means possible to hinder the Christian's witness and usefulness. If he can keep you from being an ineffective Christian, he's happy with that. He wants to. So I destroy people, lives. I mean, even in the Bible, what did he do? And Jesus cast them out of that demoniac, right? He went into the pigs and 2,000 pigs were slaughtered, as it were, that day. That's his intent, the, to kill, to rob, to destroy. Never believe it. He's evil. He's evil. But, and again, we don't focus on him, but we have an, an armor from God to fight and often the battles right here. <laughs> the battle is often fought in your mind as well. All right. Does that make sense? I hope I try to keep it as simple as possible and say, hey, it's everyday life. We need this armor. 
the shield of faith, man, take that up. Faith, you need faith. You need to trust God because that's what's going to extinguish those darts. We'll get into that, and I'm sorry for starting. So let's stop and let's pray. <laughs> All right, Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Lord, today we thank you that you're victorious over death, sin, the devil. We thank you that he's a defeated foe. Yet, he prowls around and is called the God of this world. And he's out to trick, to destroy, to, to keep us as Christians down. And Lord, so you gave us option, or not an option. You, it was no option. You said, be strong in the Lord and in your might. And so, Lord, help us to put on this whole armor of God. As we learn about this, help us to use it even this week in practical ways. Or when we're tempted to, just, to sin against you, Lord that a scripture would come and we would use it to defeat the power of the enemy in our life. God, thank you that these things are real that you've given us. Thank you that victory is possible over every area. And I just thank you and I praise you for it. Lord, I pray that this week would be a good week for you and your kingdom. The devil would suffer defeat. Lord, and help in the VBS camps and stuff that are going on throughout Vermont today too. There are these weeks coming ahead and the FCA camp, sports camp coming up too. We pray that for that. The field days, Lord, we will be able to share the gospel with many people there at the fair. We ask you, Lord, uh, for your protection, for your help in doing this, that there would be people turning from darkness to light, from the kingdom and power of Satan to God. Oh, Lord, would you do that in these days? And thank you, Lord. Thank you for being so good that you care enough for your children to tell us how to arm ourselves and to be strong in you, Lord. We admit we need you, God. We need you for everyday life. Every circumstance we come up, to, up against in life, we need you, Lord. In the plenty, we need you. And when we lack, we need you, Lord. And so we just say, would you strengthen us spiritually, God, for this week and what we might face, Lord. And so we ask you, we're trusting in you, Lord, for this. And we praise you that that victory it can be one. And so we say thank you in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.